Um, thank God for you joining us and just give an honor to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, who's the Lord of my life and just so thankful and grateful uh, for the sacrifice that he made for me uh, to allow me to be here today. Um, allow me the opportunity to, be, to share with you and be his servant. Um, I count it a privilege and an honor uh, to be called a child of God. I'm excited because this is a great time to be a child of God. Uh, as God has proven himself to us to uh, be faithful to his word. And is wh why we're here today, uh, to be faithful to our God and to uh, seek to allow him to experience our love for him and our service to him, uh, to one another, and to a lost and dying world, especially at a time when uh, all that the world offers to um, influence us to put faith in it and all that it offers, uh, God has found it necessary to shake the very foundations of the entire world. And all that we have been deceived in putting our faith and trust in. Uh, faith and trust have, that has proved worthless at the greatest time of need because it's not able to provide for us what we need. Uh, security, uh, power and authority to um, change things, to live a life of assurance and confidence and understanding of what's going on around us. And um, I'm excited, excited that uh, 37 years ago, uh, I made the right choice. Even though through that 37 years, there's been uh, great forces trying to influence us to doubt whether that was the right decision to make. Uh, I just thank God for his faithfulness and sending the Holy Spirit uh, after this resurrection to uh, be my teacher, to be my guide, my strength, my wisdom, my battle partner, uh, to take me through all the challenges of seeking to serve the true living and only God. And I thank him for that. And I thank you for joining us today, uh, taking this time to uh, share in what the Lord is doing. Um, as he is moving in your life, allowing you to be the living witness uh, that he's called us to be. So uh, my will is that, my desire is that this word will influence you and benefit you in some way uh, to move you into a closer relationship with God, uh, greater love and concern for one another, um, so that the world will know that you are God's children. Positioning yourself hopefully through what you hear today, um, to move in a greater relationship, whereas when you move about each day, uh, people will experience God through you. Even if they can't put their fingers on it, they will sense that there's something about you um, that draws them to you. And I'm believing with all my heart and soul that that's what's happening. And so I, I thank you for that, and I commend you for your commitment to uh, the word of righteousness. Uh, with that said, let's open up with a word of prayer. Oh, Lord God, Father, I just come before you with thanksgiving and praise in my heart once again, dear Lord. Thanking you, dear Father, for this a new day and another opportunity to serve you, dear Lord. Uh, we thank you for your provision, for prosperity and good health and long life, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We thank you, dear Lord, for your mercy and your grace and strengthening our faith and trust in you by uh, revealing yourself to us, dear Lord, daily through answering prayer and bringing your word to pass, dear Lord, enlightening our hearts and minds and growing us into a deeper knowledge and understanding of you, of ourselves, and your resurrection power toward us, dear Lord, that power that raised Jesus from the dead, uh, that power that empowers us to live a self-controlled life through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, that we may be your representatives here on earth, dear Lord, displaying your very character and nature as we move about each day in response to life and exposing you, dear Lord, to those that don't know you. We thank you, Father, for such mercy and grace. 
Lord, we ask you to touch our hearts and our minds today and speak a word to us, dear Lord, that will uh, continue to move us closer in our relationship with you and one another. Glorify yourself, Father. We thank you for leading us in spirit and in truth that we may um, serve you, Lord God, in righteousness, that you will experience our love for you. We thank you, Lord, and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And Lord, I present my faith to you in this uh, request, and I bless it, that it will be fruitful and multiply and bring about all that uh, you have desired for us in your word and what you're teaching us, dear Lord. Glorify yourself, Father. As your authority and power, we pray and thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Because that's what praise God means. You know, we've been studying in the book of Mark. And as we have constantly, uh, are constantly reminded that Mark presents Jesus as a servant. Uh, Mark views things that uh, others didn't see, and he shares some things, but it has a purpose. Uh, and we study the book of Mark as we do each book. Um, we look at that book to see exactly what God was trying to tell us through the author. What is the lesson that he wants us to receive from Mark? And that's why as we're going through, we want to be pay close attention to what uh, God is trying to teach us because that's what the resurrection is all about. Jesus conquering Satan, uh, defeating him, and establishing himself as the king of kings and the ruler of all creation. Uh, and in that, uh, we need to have a proper perspective of what our focus should be. Uh, in Jude uh, 1, 3, 4, 7 through 25 uh, says that beloved while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation I felt the necessity to write to you appealing uh, that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints for certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, in the last time, there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some, who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his holy, his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever, amen. Mark 16, 17 through 20 says, these signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then when the Lord Jesus has spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. Matthew 12, 28 says, but if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house 
and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. And that's why today, as we are in the book of Mark, um, we wanna continue on the journey as we uh, stated last time we were together that Jesus has come to bind the strong man, that strong man being Satan. And on this day, he completed that task. That's why he said on the cross, it was finished. Satan's reign had come to an end. His authority uh, over mankind had been broken. The sin debt is paid. God is no longer holding man's sins against him. Uh, because of what Adam did, Jesus on this day finished the undoing of that positioning humanity to be able to choose on their own free will whether to continue to live under the influence of Satan or to now serve the true and living God through the power of the Holy Spirit because of the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because although Satan has been defeated, he still has permission uh, to influence he has permission to do all he can to keep those that are, were born into his kingdom, in his kingdom. He also has the permission and the freedom to influence those that have deserted his kingdom um, to not obey their new God, their new ruler, uh, in hopes that even though he can't prevent them from going to heaven, he can prevent them from living the quality of life that Jesus promised, thus putting reasonable doubt in people's minds whether God is real or relevant uh, to their lives. By influencing those that say they know the Lord and serve the Lord uh, to operate according to their human nature, thus um, diluting their power to uh, live the life that God promised according to his promises. Going beyond the physical attributes of those promises, but the spiritual attribute, which is the necessity and the essential part, and that is the ability and power to live a life of righteousness in obedience to God. And that's what the resurrection is all about. Is now being positioned to live in obedience to God. Because before that, that was not possible because of our ruler, which was Satan. Man did not have the ability uh, to live a life that glorifies God. And so through Jesus Christ, we have been set free. Not free to do what we want to do, which we can, but free to now serve God and enjoy the full blessings of being his children. And as we move forward, uh, what we want to talk about today is, we want to talk about the deaf and mute spirit, uh, demonic possession. We're going to be coming from Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through uh, 29. And it reads, when they came back to the disciples, this is disciples and Jesus uh, coming off the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, they left the other nine disciples uh, back in town. And now they're on their way back after having such a glorious experience uh, observing the Transfiguration. And it says, uh, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately when the entire crowd saw him, talking about Jesus, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son possessed with a spirit, which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. 
And he answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit saying to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you come out of him and do not enter him again. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him and he got up. When he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot come out but by out by anything but prayer. Amen. You no, know, as Jesus is on the scene and he is teaching us how to finish what he started, driving out Satan's influence uh, in the world because Satan still has servants here. He still has authority over those servants. Uh, we are setting up a kingdom within this kingdom. Uh, and while setting up this kingdom, we are repossessing more and more authority. And we're able to do this because Jesus has prepared the way. And as we saw in the transfiguration last week, uh, it was representing the government of the kingdom of God the government that is uh, the guideline for how we operate and um, how we carry ourselves, but also learning that how to actually um, enforce the new king's rule and authority to bring about God's will. And as we establish his kingdom here on earth, as we wait for his turn. And, and as we look at the disciples as they are coming down from the mountain. Uh, Jesus, he, he encounters these people arguing with the disciples. Um, and in that process, you know, they saw Jesus. They decided to come to him. And, and he asked them, what were they arguing about? And the man that brought the deaf and mute son said, I brought my son to you. But, of course, Jesus wasn't there. And, and by this time, we know that the uh, disciples have also built a reputation of following Jesus and um, being able to do great signs and wonders and miracles. And he said that, I told them, your disciples, to cast out the demon. And, and you know, God doesn't waste words. Um, he said he taught the disciples uh, to cast the demon out of his son, and they couldn't do it. Um, I thought that was interesting that he told them to. Because um, one thing we find out, one of Satan's um, ploys is to try to make those that say they serve the Lord prove that who they say they are. And they could do the things that they say they can do. And that's a mistake if you fall for that trap. Because Jesus has told us that um, humanity is constantly looking for a sign, looking for proof. And even we ourselves, if we be honest with ourselves, uh, there's a lot of things that we go into, we need proof 
that it's going to work before we will commit to it. And even then, we are skeptical. So uh, with that said, we need to also keep in mind that the disciples are new to this way of life, of, of kingdom living, and uh, they're still in training. Keep in mind, they are still following the Lord Jesus Christ, and he still has them in training. So are we. We are still in training. We may have uh, been in church for a while, uh, but we're still in training. I've been a, a servant of God for 37 years, and I'm still in training. Um, with our understanding from the word of God that um, it takes time to become the servant of God to be able to operate in this kind of kingdom power and authority uh, that God has called us to operate in. Unfortunately, the, the church is about the only place in our society that uh, you could come in today and start from the top tomorrow. Whereas in society, you work your way from the bottom and you work your way up because uh, you could come from college with a degree in that field. Uh, but that degree doesn't give you the understanding um, and the wisdom that it takes to bring this thing to life or to operate in it on a daily basis. Um, and it takes time to work your way through uh, that discipline or whatever it is. No one's going to bring you out of college today and hire you and put you in a top position tomorrow. Uh, you're going to have to work your way through. In every position that you find yourself in, there's a working your way up to the higher levels. And that's been the biggest problem in the religious circle today is that uh, we have a lot of professing believers, uh, pastors and bishops and evangelists uh, that have not been trained in the way of righteousness. Uh, and they are thrown into situations where they're not able to um, overcome Satan's assault against them through his different temptations and things that he brings before us to get us distracted on the physical things that the world has to offer, uh, not truly understanding the spiritual aspects. So and as I'm reading this, I thought that that's what jumped out to me. They, he said he told his disciples to um, cast him out. You would think that a person that was in that state would come humbly looking and begging for help, not demanding help. Uh, and that's one of the assaults on the religious community today. Uh, if you say anything or do anything, that, that starts a process of either being trying to prove that you're wrong and don't know what you're talking about, or prove that there's a better way than the way that you have. Uh, that's not of God. Uh, Christianity is a lifestyle. God empowers us to work when he's working. And so in Mark 6, 7 through 13, we know that Jesus had earlier, he had summoned the 12 and began to send them out by twos and gave them authority over unclean spirits. And he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, uh, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, say unto it, stay there until you leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off your soles of your feet uh, for a testimony against them. So they went out and they preached and uh, that men should, be re should repent. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. But as we come into the day's situation, it's another teachable moment uh, because God works in so many different ways. And the man said that the disciples couldn't cast out the demon, which lets me know they tried. And so Jesus responds to the crowd and to the disciples. He says that, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? 
You know, this situation with the disciples is, is typical of what's going on in the church today. People are taught to believe in the scriptures, uh, to believe that uh, what the scripture says, as in James 5, 13 through 18, it says, is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is the same praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And people are being taught the scriptures. They've been taught to believe the scriptures. And, and they are go through these processes uh, that the Lord has recommended in his word. But nothing happens. Uh, they don't get healed. They don't get delivered. Uh, the thing that they pray for and make total commitment to doesn't happen. That's a dangerous place to be in because it'll put you in a position as the disciples. People lose confidence and faith in the word of God, in the way of God. That happens because it's not just about words, it's about power, it's about authority to enforce your prayers. And that's what the disciples have not obtained yet. Even though they were given instructions uh, to an authority to cast out demons, they had done it, they had experienced it, people had witnessed it. Um, maybe these people here had heard about the disciples also. But when it time, came time for the work to be done, the disciples could not come through. How often have you been put in a situation where you have been praying sincerely to God only to have your prayers not answered? And then we are taught to know that's not, that wasn't his will. And, you know, we, we, we start putting uh, safety nets in our prayer. If it's God's will, well, God tells us we're supposed to know his will. And as we shared earlier, the way you know his will is by presenting yourself to the Lord as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service to God. But unfortunately, a lot of people are in love with the idea of serving a God like this. Uh, to have this type of power and authority in your life, uh, people are in love with that. And they want all that it offers, but they don't want you messing with their sin. Because when you start talking about their sin, they say, now you're judging. Um, they say, God knows our heart and he's forgiven us for sin. Yes, he has forgiven us from sin. And he's given us freedom, but not freedom to continue to sin. Because uh, the scripture talks about those people. He says, the effective prayer of a righteous man. A righteous man is a person that obeys God and follows God's word but also who has been equipped. And we know that the disciples don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them because they have Jesus living with them. And so it goes on to talk about how Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed that it wouldn't rain. And it did not rain for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and this guy poured forth rain, and uh, the rain uh, produced this fruit. It gave the earth what it needed to produce its fruit. There are too many instances where churchgoers and people in general have been told to pray and fast for God's promises, only to have the things they were praying for not happen. Then God say, whatever you pray for, according to the promises and his will, that he would do whatever you ask. See, a lot of people are turning away from the church because they feel that the teaching is not tied to their daily needs. 
uh, thus making the teaching in, uninformative. Uh, without depth and or either just irrelevant to uh, what they call reality. That's making it ineffective and worthless for them uh, to grow or use in their daily lives. And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Is the word that I'm learning, the faith that I say I have, is it producing what God says it's supposed to produce? When I read the scriptures and compare it to my life, does my life line up with what the scriptures say? And if not, the question becomes, why? Uh, as we talked last week, uh, we have the power to heal, power to cast out demons and to heal the sick. Uh, but because of the lack of training in the word of righteousness, we miss the spiritual aspects a lot of times of what's really going on in the situations we're dealing with. As we're looking at this deaf and mute spirit, even though the son is the one that has the condition, look how that spirit is influencing everyone in its circle. Um, so Jesus tells them to bring the boy to him because when Jesus said, how long should I be with you? How long should I put up with you? His response would suggest that uh, the people and the disciples should be further along in their understanding and faith and abilities than they are. Even though they're still in training, even though the people in the land are not that in depth about what's really going on, Jesus in his analysis and his response is, you should be further than where you are. What about you? Should you be further than where you are? Based on what the Lord has been teaching you, what he's been showing you and allowing you to experience, um, that great kind of witnesses that you have in your own life. I was talking to someone on social media and they were, they were doing this rant about, um, you know, how the law shouldn't be running the church and this and that. And then I responded, you know, that's why those of us that are spiritual are supposed to be helping those that are weak. And we have to be operating in the authority of Christ so that we can have our own story. And he would constantly come back with what Paul did and what this one did. And my question was, well, what has he done for you? What is your proof? What is your story that you could tell me that God is doing on your behalf that shows that you have the authority that at times like this, you're not talking about what the government is doing or is not doing or what the false teachers are doing. The question is, what are you doing? What are you doing with Corona? What are you doing with the virus? What are you doing with it? Are you, do you have authority over it? Are you driving it out of your circles? Are, are, are people being delivered from the coronavirus in your circles of influence? Are the people in your environment protected from the coronavirus because of your spiritual awareness of what's going on and the spirits that are at work and you are taking authority over them to, to bind them and drive them out and commanding them not to uh, touch those that have been given to you? You could never give me an answer. It just constantly went to what other people's story. And my response to him was, brother, you know, move on forward. I got you covered. I've got you under the witness protection plan. You're going to be, you're going to move forward. And I pray that God gives you wisdom to continue to grow. Because it's not about Oregon. It's about, do we have the authority to have people having confidence in us? And by the disciples not being able to deliver the son, don't know where the man really was when they brought him. But as we see, he moves along. He ain't quite sure now whether his son can be helped. So Jesus says, bring the boy to me. 
And when the spirit saw Jesus, he immediately threw the boy into a convulsion and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. See, in creation, God has created different beings and things and to, when they feel threatened, the python will spread his hood. Some birds feel threatened. They will ruffle their feathers to look bigger than they are and look more menacing. Well, we're the same way. Satan's the same way. So when he comes before Jesus, he puts on this great display uh, to bring about fear. And if you've ever witnessed someone having a seizure or, or going through some things like that, it can really catch you off guard, especially if you have not been trained in that type of situation. You don't really know what to do. Uh, it'll take you off guard, and it will bring up fear. So Satan sees Jesus. He throws the bull on the ground, and he got him rolling around on the ground. I want you to. I want you to witness yourself involved in that scene. I've been involved with someone having a seizure and, and never and had never really actually seen it in person before. And, you know, it was like, man, what to do? But the first thing come to mind, let's go pray and take authority. And so that's what happened. And things got better. But it was that slight moment <laughs> when you first encountered that, first of all, that surprise, the element of surprise. The second thing, lack of knowledge and understanding about what the world says do, <laughs> but having a wherewithal through the power of the Holy Spirit to be led what to do. <laughs> Who knows what happens with the disciples when Jesus wasn't there? Uh, add that with those that are attacking you about what you do. Uh, saying that it's not right is not of God because you got these quote unquote uh, religious people that are supposed to be the authority and you're just an everyday person and you're caught in this situation where it's a time to show what you know and do it, but your mind is all in a tizzy now, depending on where you are in your walk with God. So the disciples weren't able to come through. I can imagine what that did for those that were there calling them a phony anyway. And what that actually did for their minds when they found themselves in that situation. You ever been in a situation like that? Uh, you've been praying for somebody and you're confident that this is going to happen only to see that it doesn't happen. And sometimes in situations when you're dealing with death or <clears throat> excuse me, serious health issues. And people have confidence in you and they've come to you and you've gone through your thing and it doesn't work. What does that do for you? See, because the thing is, Satan always wants the, the situation to look bigger than what it really is. Compared to the authority and power that you have based on who you are. But you have to know that for a certainty, understand that, and have grown in the understanding of that knowledge, power, and authority. And that's what is missing. That's what this is all about as we're looking at this deaf, mute spirit. See, because if Satan can get you to fear, he is able to accomplish his objective of staying in power and control. Satan was able to stay in power and control by the disciples' efforts that failed. It doesn't tell us why, but as we look at this spirit and what it actually represents as we move on, it's going to give us some insight on what was really going on. However, as the demonic spirit is doing this thing in front of Jesus, Jesus keeps his composure. What Jesus does, he observes the situation 
and asked questions that he deemed were necessary to determine how to move forward to set the boy free. See, and a lot of times we just jump into things without really observing what's really going on and why it's going on. Could be from past experience, which we'll deal with that as we move on later. So Jesus asked the father, how long had he been this way? The father says, from childhood. And suggesting that the boy may be a teenager or a young adult. This reveals that Satan has total control over the boy and he's had it for a while. At this stage, there's no reaching him, his mind, or his heart. That's very important because as we learn how to minister for God, the first thing you have to understand is the patient, the client. And a lot of times we start prescribing solutions without really having analyzed what the real problem is. And the father informed Jesus that, now this is regular, this goes on regularly. And he said, sometimes the spirit will try to kill the boy by drowning, trying to drown him or uh, throwing himself in the fires. Uh, this lets us know that the boy had to be under constant watch or restraints. Now it's the boy that has the condition but look how the condition is impacting those in his world. So that means he's, from a world's perspective, he's suicidal. So that means he has to stay on the constant watch. What if the father works? Does he have a wife? Does it, it, it impacts everybody that's involved. The father doesn't have the condition, but he's influenced by the condition. You may not have the condition of some of those in your world, but you have to ask yourself, how is their condition influencing you? See, because the father is now a prisoner of the mute spirit himself and all of those that are in his circle. That's what we have to understand. When we're talking about the authority and power to drive out Satan's influence in our lives. You may be teaching the truth or walking in the truth, but how about those that don't walk in the truth and teach the truth? How does that spirit that's leading them influence you? Does it influence you in a way that keeps you in line with God and who he's called you to be and allows you to walk in your power and authority? Or does it lead you off into the human nature in some form or fashion? which brings us to our first principle. When we're talking about deaf, mute spirits, it hinders your ability to hear and to talk and understand. See, when you can't hear, you don't hear sound. And when you don't hear sound, you can't develop the words. Physically, he had a condition of being deaf and mute. But actually what's on the table for believers is the spiritual aspect of being deaf and mute and not able to understand. How long will I have to put up with you? How long will I be with you? Hebrews 5, 11, 14 says, concerning him, we have much to say and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice, who because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. You see, you have to understand that all humanity is born into this world deaf and mute to the things of God. Jesus is now in this world trying to teach a deaf, mute world about the things of God. 
That's why he kept asking the disciple, you don't understand yet about the miracles and the 5,000 being fed and the 4,000. You don't understand yet because they are spiritually deaf. And because they're spiritually deaf, they're not truly understanding Jesus clearly. And because they're not understanding clearly, they're not able to speak the language of the kingdom. And when you're not able to speak or hear, it's hard to understand what you should be doing. And nothing is more confusing than not truly understanding what you're doing. It's insecurity, uncertainty, doubt, fear, a whole gamut of emotions that move you further away from hearing God and serving God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, but a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. How will you know then if you are being impacted by a deaf, mute spirit? You will constantly find yourself operating in self-destructive behavior and making self-destructive decisions. See, the spirit was showing himself through the boy, but the spirit was also operating in the land. And part of his responsibility is to hinder people from receiving the things of God. Because God said, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to those who have been blinded by the prince of this world, who are headed to destruction. So this concept and this principle is, is that you may not have a, be deaf physically and unable to talk physically. But I want you to ask yourself, as a child of God, building the kingdom of God, coming into a new kingdom, are you talking the language of the kingdom? or the language of the old world. See, when you learn the language of the kingdom, you view things from a different perspective. You view it from the kingdom perspective. See, when you are not deaf and mute, you're able to see God at work in everything. You're able to understand what's going on now from a spiritual perspective. Instead of thinking that the Lord is getting ready to return any moment, or even thinking you're in the rapture, which is, if you're in the rapture, you, the president ain't your problem if you're in the rapture. You missed the boat. <laughs> you got greater problems than who's in office. But when you're deaf and mute and unable to understand, you can't make sense of the stuff that's going on around you. And so your mind goes into speculation. You know, what if this, what if this, oh my God, you can't see nothing but destruction. I don't see nothing but good health. The Lord is not getting ready to return. We don't know the day or the hour, but this is not the season. Why? Because if he's healing the land, the church, the land has to be healed first. Then the church has to be allowed to live in that healed land. And they are allowed that freedom as long as they stay in control. You remember the children of Israel? God would deliver them. Life would go good 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Then the good times, they fall into sin, and now they have to go back to suffer again. The church has to not, the, not only is Lord going to heal the land, because the church has positioned itself to rule the land, it has the right to rule the land until it falls away from that rule, God forbid. There's nothing wrong with Jesus coming back and the world being in a great shape. He's going to come back. The church, the land being healed, God, the church ruling the land, that's not a bad thing. It's not going to come prevent Jesus from coming back. What's wrong with him coming back when things are good? if that's the way God intended for it to be. But we were so programmed into 
the worst case scenario. It doesn't have to end on a bad note, saints. <laughs> you know, and people are like, it's such a bad time now. The Lord has to be returned. Man, I, I, you know, why can't we overcome it and it be a good time and the sun be shining when he come back and, and the world be good? There's still going to be people that are not going to make it because of how good it gets. But the point of making this this mindset that we have about life, because we're deaf to the spirit of God and him working. Things are bad, so he must be getting ready to return. You realize they've been saying that since Jesus left? More than two days ago, but you know, two days and a few hours. But every hour, it's like he's getting ready to come back any minute. Every generation has had a, a movement of God as he was moving about to get people's attention, that God's got it. I mean, it's so bad, God got to be returning. How many antichrists have we had in the minds of people since Jesus left? 2000, he was supposed to come back. I mean, uh, you can't fathom the year 2000. It's got to be the end because you're so used to the 19s. So, man, it's gonna, some special going to happen in 2000. So God going to return, I believe. I mean, that's just the speculation of mankind because he's deaf and mute to the things of God. Are you finding yourself operating in self-destructive behavior? What I mean, God moves you to a place to improve your life. You work down that place, life gets better. After it's good for a while, you start to move yourself back to that old state of being. The things that you've discovered in life that make life better for you, are they still a consistent part of your life? in any aspect of it. Unfortunately, we will put those good things off and go back to the old way of doing things and we live a seesaw life back and forth. Death to the things of God. And so in verse 22 and 24, because of this deaf and mute spirits influence, not just in the boy, but in the land itself, the father responded to Jesus and said, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Jesus said, if you can, what are you talking about? If I can, how much of this cow do you need to eat before you believe that I can do what it is that I do? But I don't quite blame the, blame the man because he's deaf also to the things of God. His first encounter, I'm assuming, was the disciples, which were supposed to be representing Jesus, who had a power and authority to drive out spirits. You've been blessed by God in some tough situations up until the day, and the Lord has delivered you from them. But that was then. But today, Lord, this monster that I got now, I don't know. If you can, if it's your will, Jesus said, if I can, Jesus said, listen, all things are possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? I guess I said that right. I believe, but help my unbelief. I have a certain level of belief because that's what got me here. And it couldn't be said, I was all pumped up. I was ready for this thing to be done because you weren't here. Your boys were here. They represent you. They got power. So I'm going to call them on to take care of this thing. And boom, failure, crash, and burn. Now, who knows what kind of impact that had on the man. Obviously, he had enough faith to get there. But he told them to heal. Now, slight speculation, which is only worth nothing, because I wasn't there and God didn't find it necessary to make it available. Imagine this, you and some religious people are having a discussion about what you can do in the Lord. 
you telling them how you can be healed from this. You can be healed from this. You can be healed from that. You can be delivered from that. And you can be delivered from this. And y'all got this argument going on. Number one, you're already in the wrong spirit because you're arguing, okay? Two, someone's in the crowd listening to you. The person said, you say you can do what? You can deliver me from diabetes? Yeah. Well, prove it here. I got, I got, person got diabetes right here. You can go on, take care of this now. Go on, heal them right now. If you bite on that one, you're in trouble. Because <laughs> that's the ploy of the enemy. I didn't say that happened. But knowing people sometimes and seeing the environment, what was going on, being around church folks, religious folks, and people trying to talk about doing the right thing, it don't take much to get caught up. But all that's part of Satan's plan to get you caught up in the human nature. Regardless of what your intentions are when you get there, Scripture says you won't be able to hear from God, you won't be able to do anything for God, nor will you be able to please God because Satan has fooled you out on his territory. You know, I was looking at this picture where this guy, you know, uh, these, these bad men were trying to take this woman's property. Dad was dying. Uh, the hero came in and he stayed there. Then he found out that. So he went to the guy, said, look, you, know, you leave this person alone. Don't take their property or it's going to be a problem. And the guy said, look, I ain't scared of you, but I like a good excitement. So uh, I'd like for you to fight against my best. And then if you win, she can keep the property. Well, he was looking at this big guy beside him that he felt in his mind that he could beat. So he said, sure, no problem. So he gets off his horse. He's getting ready to fight the guy. He said, oh, no, Bubba, come here. This big Bubba comes out of the house, and he looks like, like oh, my God, what have I got myself into? <laughs> the guy beat him up, beat him up pretty bad, but he, you know, he, the hero, he, he finds out a way to knock him out and uh, win the fight. But see, he was assuming... <laughs> based on what he saw, that he could have the victory. Not knowing that there was a surprise inside. He assumed that that was the man, but that wasn't the man. And a lot of times in our situations, we are assuming one thing because of what God may have done before, but we haven't really evaluated what's going on and how God works. God doesn't operate in fussing and fighting because that's not his territory. That's Satan's territory. And we have to start becoming wise enough so that we don't allow the enemy to pull us out there uh, when God has not sent us out there. And that's what happens so many times. It could be because of your compassion for people uh, in certain situations and circumstances where you just so compassionate about helping uh, that you move out ahead of God. That's one of the ways that this deaf, mute spirit works also. Because in that time, you don't think about to talk to God or if he's talking to you, you can't hear him because you're so caught up in the flesh. All things are possible for him who believes. I believe the man believed because he came. But he doesn't really know God like that himself personally. You see, Sometimes we can stay in a situation for so long. We learn how to live with it. And it becomes a way of life for us. Although we know that others have been delivered from the same condition, and we agree that we can too, but we are not really expecting to be delivered. That's because we take ownership of the condition. And when you take ownership of a condition, it hinders God's power working in our lives because the condition has authority over us in this area. We don't have authority over it. And whoever you submit yourself to to obey, that's whose slave you become. Time has a way of wearing you down or building you up. See, when the man's Here's Jesus' response. If you can, all things are possible. All things are possible to him that believes. He's convicted of his sin. Although he believes Jesus does what he does, it may not be possible for him. 
even though he knows Jesus does what he does, but you know, this is my condition, my son's condition, who has become all of our condition. And we've been in it so long. We've tried so many ways out. We've done so many things and nothing has happened. And subconsciously, you really don't want to set yourself up for another letdown. That's why the man says, if you can, I ain't gonna get my hopes all up and you can't. And subconsciously you can hear and see professing believers living like that. Well, maybe it's not God's will. If God is healing the land, if he's undone everything that Satan has done, and he's empowering us to do the impossible. What is it about Satan that you believe that God says it's okay to stay active in the lives of his creation and mankind? You can't say you believe that God is healing the land and you are not willing to make the decision to be delivered from some that proves that or shows that our life is supposed to be an example of what God is doing. We have to stop taking ownership of what does not belong to us. Sickness, death, pain, and suffering does not belong to the kingdom. Hear me clearly. All of these things came in after the fall. They were never intended to be God's way. But because man on his own free will chose to disobey God, he allowed these things to come into this world. And because he allowed these things to come into this world, God has left him the responsibility to drive these things out of the world. That's you, me, and our responsibility to drive out Satan's influence in our lives, in our circles of influence, and in the world. Not complain, but to bring about change. This man's disappointment over the years has led him to believe that this may just be his plight in life. What about you? What is it in, in your life that you have decided this just may be my plight and you've programmed your mind to be okay with it you've adjusted your life to live with it and you move on as if it is too big for god but the real problem is you know it's not too big for god it is too big for you because you are afraid to take the chances of making the decisions you need to make so that God can reveal himself to you in that place and deliver you because of the consequences in your mind that you think are gonna come because you're deaf to God in this place. And because you're deaf to God in this place, you can't speak right concerning a condition so that you can be delivered from it. There's always a but, a what if. That's the impact of a deaf, mute spirit that doesn't allow you to hear God correctly because Satan is so loud in your ear concerning this condition. He has so many proofs and so many evidence that most have died you consider your, you should consider yourself blessed that you still alive and able to function quote unquote with a subnormal life to be able to do more than those that have the condition that are not able to do so you feel blessed which you are but you're not delivered you're not healed you're settling for crumbs of the children's table 
because you refuse to move into the position of a son, of a child of the king. Although the son has the condition, the whole family is a prisoner of it, which brings us to our second principle. We are talking about the mute deaf spirit. It snatches away what has been sown in his heart concerning Jesus. It snatches away what has been sown in the hearer's heart concerning Jesus. It says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand, how can I be delivered from this when it's such a hopeless situation? This is mental. They call this mental illness this boy has. The brain ain't working right. You can't fix that. You can. You can fix it by removing that foreign object that is causing it to operate outside of how it was intended to operate. He says, when he hears the word and don't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in the heart. The man knew when he left home, I'm going to see Jesus. My son is going to be delivered today. I believe that because he's done so many more miraculous things than this. And he said that anyone that comes, he heals. He doesn't turn anyone away. It doesn't matter whether they were a Jew, whether they were lost, whether they were sinners. He said, I've heard the news and I'm going to take my son to go sin. And you're excited when you leave and you're on your way there. But as you're traveling down the road to deliverance, the enemy starts to talk to you. Start to remind you of all the other failures you had. He reminds you of all of those others that have tried and died in the process. At least you're still living. At least you still have some form of life. Why are you going to go and rock the boat when you could lose it all? Let well enough be well enough. And the closer you get, the more you challenge. And Lord, have mercy before you get to your cure, you run into an imposter that looks like where you're going. He's an associate of where you're going. Matter of fact, he's a pupil of where you're going. Well, I've heard that they can do the same thing. Let me go on try them. See, the enemy know how to set you up. So by the time when the cure really get there, you don't even know whether you want it or not anymore, if you can do anything. See, that's the enemy working on your mind because he has a place where you listen to him at. And he's hoping to snatch that faith out. That's why Jesus understood the season he was in and what he was doing. Because he knew what he was doing is going to require faith. But what he's doing is not based on the faith of people. It's based on his faith and what he's been called to do. He's come to defeat Satan. So wherever Satan is working, his mission is to defeat him. But in the process, it's the learning where the people are so that they can have faith in what he's doing and they can stand in that faith and share that faith with others. And Satan knows how dangerous a person is once they have faith in Jesus. And so he works overtime. That those that are trying to slip out of his grasp, he works overtime to keep them there. And those that have slipped out of his grasp, he works overtime to just find reasonable doubt in their minds so that they cannot go against his work because they will be rendered powerless. He comes and snatches it away. This is the one whom seed was sown beside the road. See, the man had responded to Jesus, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. By now, it had been well publicized of what Jesus was doing. This is why the man was there. It's been well publicized what goes on at Day Spring Christian Church. Folks know you that you ain't never thought about because they've been hearing about you. That's why there's always someone kicking your tires. So a lot of times people come up on you and you just think it's you just meeting someone. They're coming to test you, to see if you all of that. That's why you can't be getting caught up. 
You got to be careful that you are representing your God at all times. So when you let your head down, you're letting your head down, but you are still glorifying God. And people will try to get you comfortable, to get you caught out there, to see what you're hiding to see what's really down on the inside when you're dealing with certain situations or, or they're having conversations. Are you getting caught up in the conversation uh, even though the conversation doesn't represent someone that has trust and faith in God? You see, this is what the demons do to us. They influence us to not deeply desire the life-giving words of our Lord. See, we have this problem when we don't read the scriptures on a regular basis to get the word sown in our heart and our mind. Because it's the Holy Spirit that's going to bring the understanding to you. And a lot of times, because of that deaf, mute spirit, when you're reading the word, you say, you can't understand this. This don't make sense. Let's just stop. Reading it is not to understand it. Reading it is to get it programmed on your computer, which is your mind, in the archive, so that when you go through life each day, the Holy Spirit knows what word to pull out of that archive and said, this experience today is this word right here, and this experience is going to help us grow into an understanding of that word that you didn't understand when you wrote, read it, but thank God you kept reading it because now we can go into the archive and pull out the word that you need to now grow into a deeper understanding of because you're no longer deaf nor mute. And the enemy said, you can't keep reading if you don't understand. No, it's like writing something but you want to make it perfect <laughs> as you're writing it? <laughs> That's a distraction and what prevents you from being an effective writer. The key with writing and communicating is to trust what's coming in your mind, not as a finished product, <laughs> but putting the information down. And once you get the information down, then you go back through and read what you wrote with to get a deeper understanding of what you're trying to say. But because of that deaf mute spirit, we won't even put it down so we can have something to go back and understand. Because we're trained by the enemy, if it don't make sense and perfect when you first try it, leave it alone. That's why most people don't come to the Lord because they say they got to get their life right first. That ain't going to never happen. Your life won't be right until you get on the other side when you have shed this flesh that is no longer fighting against you and you are totally spirit with a spiritual body and mind. That's why it says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. You see, your view of God will determine your view of life or your view of life will determine your view of God. The Father's view of life determine his view of God. And a lot of professing believers' view of life and what the world has taught us determines their view of God and what they can expect and what they cannot expect. If you want to see spiritual victory in your life, you must start with God's view of the matter. There is no condition that Satan brought into this world that you can't not be delivered from. If your view of God is correct, Regardless of how deadly it may be, if it's not from God, you do not have to accept it. You do not have to live with it because God said he will deliver you from it. But it all depends on your view of God. See, when you start to operate on God's truth about the matter truthfully, you will start to see the supernatural enter into the battle to intervene in your matter to bring you victory because of the next level that God is taking you to, God will appear to be absent and silent during these times. And it'll appear that you cannot hear him because he's giving you all that you need to know for this situation. God does not bring you into a situation in the blind. He brings you into a situation that he's already prepared you for. And what you need to do when you get into these situations, when you are believing that God ain't talking to you, you say, 
oh, he's already told me. So instead of looking for new information, Holy Spirit, let's go into the archive of what God has already taught me. Because I wouldn't be here if he hadn't taught me and prepared me. If, if I haven't been deaf and blind and unable to speak the language of the kingdom, what do I mean? You've been studying the word. You've been applying the word. And you are now growing in your knowledge and understanding. But if you haven't, if you're deaf and you're mute, you're going to go into that list where God says, my people are destroyed daily for lack of knowledge. And the reason that they can't, they won't get the knowledge, they are trying to understand it before they get it. You got to read it when your mind's saying it ain't doing nothing for you, because that's what's your problem. That's that deaf, mute spirit trying to prevent you from getting the word in. You got to just keep reading. I mean, just read. Trust me, if you read it, it's going to get stored. You might not can just go back and recall it, but when the time comes, it will be brought to your remembrance. The problem is we're not putting it in there. Because the enemy knows that if you put it in there, the Holy Spirit is going to pull it out whenever you need it. But he tries to influence you not to do your part to grow in knowledge, to prepare yourself. In your circumstances, you must be speaking to God. Your trials are a journey of discovery where you get to know your God and yourself. God wants to take you to a place of understanding in him you have never been before. He's taken the disciples into a place of understanding that they haven't been before. And that's what we're gonna discover as we move forward. So we'll understand that in every situation, God has given us what we need. And if you don't know what to do, that's because God ain't told you what to do. And don't you try to do it till you go talk to God. Talk to the Holy Spirit. God wants to take you to a place of understanding to him that you've never been before. Um, because as we're looking at this lesson today, deaf, mute spirits, try to prevent us from hearing God and understanding God so that we can't talk the language of God when we approach our different situations. Um, that's all that we have today. I want you to take those two principles and the things that we've talked about today and really analyze yourself. This is an awesome time. God has a slow down now. Uh, everybody has been saying that, you know, they don't have time to study like they need to study or want to study. All across the world, everybody's in the crowd, don't have time. There are books written on how to have more time when there's no such thing. You're always going to have the same amount of time. The question is, how am I going to utilize my time effectively? But God in his infinite wisdom and healing the land knows how distracted people are in their busyness. He has shut the entire world down because he ain't just dealing with you, me, or us. He's dealing with every human being on the planet. You now have time for that, that is important. Your family, your own personal growth and development, your relationship with the Holy Spirit, and God, to become that saint that God has called you to be. Who would have figured that God loves us so much, cared about our concerns so much of not having enough time, that he decided to shut the whole world down just for you? And that's what I call a loving God. He's answered your prayers. He's given you what you need. He's prepared you to weather the storm. He's got the blood over your doorpost, so ain't none of these things that he's bringing judgment on the world will impact you. Now, if that ain't love, I don't know what love is. Be blessed, saints. I enjoyed my time with you today. I hope you are inspired and encouraged through what we shared today about this deaf, mute spirit. Realizing that you don't have to have the condition to be influenced by the spirit. Check yourself.
to see whether you are in Christ Jesus or not. That is, if you are in Christ. And if you find yourself not in Christ, it is a great season to come on in. Because what I've observed, humanity cleans up well in Christ Jesus. Come on in. Water's fine. Don't keep standing in the rain. Love you. God bless you. Let's close up with a word of prayer, and we'll be seeing you next time. Oh, Lord God, Father, we just thank you for this time today in your word, Lord God. And I just said, hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord. Lord, you're such an awesome God. You've given us the time that we need. You've given us the things that we need, the Lord, and you have empowered us, Lord, to make it so. And we said, thank you. Fill us, Lord, that we will be a blessing that all we come in contact with this day that you be glorified. Holy Spirit, lead us in spirit and in truth that God may experience our love for him today as we are so excited about him allowing us to experience his love. We love you, Lord, and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory with a hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to your name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. See you next time, saints. Enjoy it, you. Have a blessed day and definitely be a blessing to all that you come in contact with. See you next time at Dayspring Christian Church Ministry Service. See ya.